Hello and welcome. I'm Erin Cuthbert, footballer for Chelsea and the Scotland national team, and you're listening to the Blue Day podcast. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Yes, folks, this is the Blue Day podcast, and for Chelsea fans everywhere, every day is a Blue Day. I am your host, Keith Lawrence, and joining me this week, he is a man who has now started the Kepa Ariza Balaga fan club, and he's a man who has offered to drive Hakim Ziyech to Milan himself. Here is Steve Wick. Steve, welcome to the show. It's been hectic for both of us today, but we've found time to do the recording. Yeah. How are you? And did you enjoy your weekend? Well, I did until the last sort of injury time minutes at Stamford Bridge, really. Oh. It was going so well. And um, yeah, but those games have, have ended in one all draws so many times. Um, no, it was, uh, I was gutted, to be honest with you. Because, um, yeah, it just seems to always end up as a draw. And we need to win that game to close the gap at the top. Well, what we'll do, we'll start with the recent game. We will talk We will talk a little bit of the Aston Villa and Brentford since the last time we've sort of spoken, we've done yeah. the recording. But we'll talk about the United one as it's partly fresh in our memories, partly stained in our memories because of that header. Um, we've also got a couple of fan questions that we've got from the listeners. A couple of them sent me over on Facebook Messenger. So if you do have a question for the show that you want to uh, ask us, or if, in fact, you want to just air your views and say who's shit and who you think's one of the top players in the squad, let us know. Uh, you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, and... Well, actually, you can contact us on YouTube as well. You can type it on the comment section. But we'll talk about the United game first. Graham Potter, for me, did the right thing in terms of changing the tactics early. Steve, I think you'll probably agree with that. Three midfielders yeah. against two midfielders is never a good sign. No. He put Kovacic on, who seems to be the general of the group. Changed the game. Changed the game massively. And there was a bit of the game I actually thought he was playing a diamond midfield, which I haven't yeah. seen since the days of Mourinho in terms no, of he play diamond midfield. Mount, and, uh... Mount as a 10 with Kovacic and Loftus-Cheek in midfield and Jorginho as, as the holding. For me, that changed the dynamic of the game. It gave us more possession. It allowed Aspinacueta and Chilwell to bomb forward as well. Performance wise wasn't great, but I thought we was in. Con- I thought we was comfortable. We weren't in control, but I thought we was comfortable. United yeah. again. Well, w- w- we said this last season. Probably the worst United side in living memory. They've got a little bit better because Mister Maguire's not playing. He's going to be captain of England next month, but he's not playing for United at the moment. But looking at it. Is it two points dropped, bearing in mind how we played? And I think there was a little bit of... I just saw a little bit of tired legs after the game against Brentford a little bit. Might be a poor excuse. But is it two points dropped or is it a point gained, Steve? No, I think it's, uh, Keith, I think it's two points dropped. When you're winning 1-0 and you go into injury time, you expect to see that out. And, um, and we didn't. Um, and it's still a bit like, you know, everyone said, you know, that was a hard game at Brentford. Well, actually, Brentford got hammered at Aston Villa. Um, and we drew. And I said, I'm looking at those two games. And I think we dropped four points there. You know, we should beat Brentford at Brentford. We should be, when you're 1-0 up and you're going to injury time, <coughs> you should beat Man United. You've done the hard bit. Let's see it out. And... We didn't, and it's sad, really. 
you know, the guy's not six foot two, he's not six foot one. It's about players taking responsibility in their own 18 yard box. And over my dead body, is that guy going to head a ball into the goal? And I think that's what's lacking in our, in our team at the moment. You know, we, 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 we settled in many ways for second best than we should be. When you one up, you see the game out, you do it, you do things right. And our defending with that goal was, I thought, naive and very poor, to be honest. And those situations in those last seconds can make or break your season. Considering Chilwell was up against two midfielders for that cross, because if Casemiro wasn't going to get it, the poor man, Billy Gilmore, would have done it. Who, by the way, and we will we'll touch on this, I don't know whether you saw this, Steve, but somebody brought this to my attention. Tim Howard done the punditry on ESPN to cover the game over in the States. And he thought that wasn't a penalty between McTominay and Brozier. What was your thoughts? Stonewall? Oh, it was a penalty. God, oh, it was God, a penalty. Yeah, of course it was. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No. Um, no, penalty. Um, I don't think anyone could ever argue against that, could they? Oh, they have. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, I, the, I was stunned by it. It was, a, it was a Stonewall penalty. The fact that United were moaning about it. I'm guessing they're moaning about it because they realised they could have lost the game. And they should have lost the game. Jorginho, fair play to him, smacked the ball in brilliantly. Great penalty. But, as you say, Steve, we dropped off. We allowed we, them. And... We, we are missing. We are missing something. And we're missing... Well, I know who we're missing at the moment. A certain just... right fullback. Oh yeah, yeah, without doubt, you, you can't, you can't. But what I'm saying is, Aubameyang is the go-to player when it's when you're winning a game one nil. You need to win that game. You got to get that next goal you, to put it out of doubt. And to me, he was poor. Fantastic, he was poor. Um, um, is he the answer? No. If I was Chelsea now, I'd be scouring the globe for a centre forward that is going to be making impact in this high class of football. Um, because he is not, he's not good enough anymore. He's way. And then I hear about we're signing Cristiano Ronaldo, and I'm thinking to myself. Oh my God! Our two centre backs and our two centre forwards would be—I don't know—hundreds of years, wouldn't they? Well, I'm glad you mentioned him because there is a report going on again. With oh my God, there's rumours and whatnot that Todd is a fan of Ronaldo, wants yeah, Cristiano sure was, to come I, to I, Chelsea. Listen, Keith, we've always been fans of Ronaldo. Oh, I yeah. haven't. Ten years, he's been unbelievable. But he's passed it. That's not the player Chelsea should go for. You know, with all due respect, we're signing older players on a whim that they're going to... Is it the name rather than the player itself that well, Todd it's, likes? It's, it's, it's got to be. Thing, it's the American thing. You know, unfortunately... Who's the very famous quarterback that has won with Tampa Bay Buccaneers? And, you know, they think there's life in the old dog yet. And I'll tell you what, all that guy has done since he's, he's arrived at Man United has behaved extremely badly. It's not about him. It's about the team. Uh, uh, and they had a great win against Tottenham. And the whole thing ended up talking about him. You know, it's not about him. You know, he's had a fantastic career. He's a very fit, dedicated footballer. But he's the last thing we need at this football club. At this time, we need to get a hungry centre-forward 
that wants to score goals and wants to create a name for himself. And I'll tell you what, our little lad, I wouldn't put that past him that he could do that. Braja. Is it Braja? Yes, it. Yeah. I, you know, to me... I, I would have started him on Saturday because I no, thought those two centre-backs... And he shows he wants to do things. Mm. He wants to have a go. He wants to put himself about. Mm. That's what we need. We don't need someone that's going to go out there and be a prima donna and, and yeah. No, not for me. I think that would be a major step backwards. Major step backwards. We'll, you know, what are we going to do? Give him a three-year deal so he's 40 when he leaves Chelsea Football Club? No, not for me. And I think he's behaved despicable, really. As a, as a professional footballer, his behaviour that night when he went off early, when the manager wanted to put him on, you know, there were talks that he was on 500 grand a week. I know money's not everything. I always say that. But you know something? If a, if you're in that sort of money and the manager wants to put you on with two minutes to go or three minutes to go, well, do it. Do it. But don't sulk and cause a problem. And take all the headlines of what that club deserved with that win against Tottenham. And it all ends up being about him. No, not for me. Well, you heard it here first. Steve Wicks does not want Cristiano Ronaldo to join Ch- Chelsea. I certainly don't want him to join Chelsea, not just because of he's walking off against Tottenham, but the fact that how many over 30s, with all due respect, do you need to sign? Um, there's going to come a point where they're going to have to be changed. You only have to look at Barcelona for that, the fact that they're relying on, on a lot of over 30s. Well, in time, that's going to change. And we've got a lot of players in that bracket, the likes of Aspilicueta, Silva, Aubameyang as well. For me, Brozier, uh, I mean, Christ, the, the guy has done quite well since he's come on. He's got a very good goal against Wolves the other week. The guy needs to be given a chance. I hope he's given a chance against Salzburg midweek. I hope he's been given a chance. Keith, I think you you go out and spend, I don't know, <clears throat> 10 million. But then striker-wise, who's out there? Realistically. Who's out there? Well, they are, they're gold dust, aren't they, at the moment? Hmm. They are gold dust. And, um, I thought we signed the guy at Leipzig, didn't we? We were supposed to have signed him and got first option on him. Uh, and Cuckoo, he's he's more of a winger slash inside forward. He's not a proper number nine as in what Aubameyang is. He's a fine player. But, yeah, that's not been confirmed yet. That's, the world talks are still progressing. Medical, I think, has been done, but there's no confirmation. I, uh, as we said, I think the other week, Steve, I don't think it's going to be announced until after the World Cup. No. Definitely. But no. we'll talk about more of the, of the the United game, though, as well, because what I thought was interesting was with us playing how we did, you looked at both sides. A draw was probably a fair result, but we're not, I don't think, going to be at that point where we're going to be challenging City for the top honours, I think we could probably catch Liverpool in terms of finishing above them this season, could be. But in terms of the the, the equaliser, Steve, we'll, we'll touch on it now. And actually, one of the listeners actually asked a question on this. Should Kepper have done better with that header? I think he went with the wrong arm. I really think he went with the wrong arm. You think he should have gone with his right arm, then his left? Yeah, gone with his left arm. And yet, if you stretch your right arm out, left arm out, you've got an extra four inches. Mm. And I think that would have made a difference. I did think he went with the wrong arm. But having said that, I'm not president of the Kappa fan, uh, fan club. <laughs> but he's kept us in a lot of games and he's been very, playing very well lately. And... Let's be fair about it. 
half an inch the other way could have got it away. And it was a great effort, but I felt that he used his wrong arm. Well, as I said the other week, we'll give credit where credit's due. He did very well against Aston Villa. I thought he was brilliant. He I did feel. very well against Aston Villa, and he, I thought he did very well against Brentford. Although the game weren't great, I know some Chelsea fans were saying we shouldn't have drew that game, we should have won, Brentford are crap, blah, blah, blah. I thought Kepa made some very good saves in that game yeah, as did. well to keep us within touching distance of trying to win the game. So you look at the long-term solution, I think it, I think, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, Steve, especially considering what we've said in the past, I think it would be foolish to swap him back to Mendy now. I, listen, I, I think that, that Kappa, as I said to you, sometimes in life, you have to re, rebuild yourself. You come to a, a, a real, and he came to the lowest ebb of his life. Everyone wanted him out. Everyone didn't believe in him. And he had the bullets, excuse my French, to knock himself down and build himself up. And he's come out, I think, a very good goalkeeper. Um, and the way he's played, I think Aston Villa, I thought he was absolutely superb. Um, and you've got to give him credit because that's not easy. What he's gone through isn't easy. And he's come out the other side and he is, I think, a very good goalkeeper. As I told you many times, Tim. You have told <laughs> You have <laughs> told me many times, which is fair enough. You you are entitled to your opinion, and that's fine. I hope, seeing how he gets on, he seems, his stature's improved in terms of what he looks like as a goalkeeper. He Dare I say, he does look a little bit more commanding, whereby yeah, yeah. he... Before Andy he did look a little bit, you know, he was Listen, worried about came, his own shadow, let alone the ball. But but he came with a big, a massive price on his head, didn't he? He had all yes. that. Price. <clears throat> he was a, a relatively young man, and things didn't go right from the start. But you know something? He said the balls to go back to basics, come out the other side, and I think he's been absolutely brilliant. Was you impressed, well, we'll talk about sort of the Villa and the Brentford games now. Was you impressed with our build-up play and how we controlled the game against Villa? We got the early goal through Mount and, you know, Tyro Mings with an assist, which probably means you ain't going to go to the World Cup this summer. Uh, sorry, this summer, this winter, excuse me. Um, Mount did very well. He's got a beautiful free kick to score the second. We don't normally win at Villa Park. That is one of our sort of bogey grounds in terms of trying to get a result. But we did quite well there. And then the Brentford game, one huge positive was the clean sheets. And the fact that Casemiro's injury time goal was the first goal conceded under Potter. Considering who we've played and how we've come from that to what happened earlier on with Tuchel, it's not a crisis. It's not a catastrophe. I think it's been very positive. It's been very encouraging. And again, we'll see where it goes. When We're not going to win the league. I could say we might challenge for third spot at least. Most definitely. Um, Spurs looks like they're falling like a stone, which is nice to see. Newcastle concerned me a little bit. But... Hey, you know, we'll take it as it comes, Steve. Well, I don't think, listen, I think this is where our standards of um, certainly this season have dropped a little bit. You know, um, the fact that we're pleased with a draw at Brentford, I think, isn't what we're about. Yeah. Um, the fact that we we beat Aston Villa, but they caused us a lot of problems. They played quite well that day, and they caused us a lot of problems. Um, but we won the game 2-0. But if I was a Chelsea fan, well, if I'm a, if I am a Chelsea fan. Um, <laughs> Take that Tottenham Hotspur shirt off. 
No. Oh, you had a laugh on me. <laughs> um, but um, I wouldn't get carried away because there's pros and cons about both results. Mm. And I don't think any Chelsea supporter over the last 10 years would have been, oh, ten, yeah, for 10 years we've been happy with the draw at Brentford. And I thought we were a little bit inept there. We, we should have taken the game to them a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, two away games. Unfortunately, the big game was Man United. And instead of going to seven points out of three games, we went to five. That's a big difference. Mm. Um, and as you know, there's going to be a massive scramble for that top four. And the one thing that's important for our club is that we get one of those top four positions. But Tottenham, to me, are paying the price that Conte did with Chelsea. He's playing very, very, very boring, bland football. And they are struggling. Do you remember when we played Man City away? And he never played a centre forward. Yes. Uh, a friend of mine I know quite well went to that game when we lost 6-0. Yeah. And, yeah, a real tough one to take on that one. But He turns around today and he says he needs three transfer windows to transform Tottenham. Yes, I heard oh. that. My that God. made me laugh. I have to. I have to admit. Oh, wait a second. <clears throat> you know, Daniel Levy is the tightest chairman in the whole country. Must be thinking to himself, "How much I got to spend in those three windows?" You know, oh, no. Well, from the stories I've heard, he's not as bad as Alan Sugar. Oh God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, though, I want to talk about two players in particular. Two players that. have the divided opinion amongst the Chelsea faithful from what I saw from Facebook and social media on Saturday that I was trying to not get too despondent about the result. Um, Kai Havertz and Raheem Sterling, Steve, we have mentioned them once or twice before this season. Um, Sterling, I've actually voiced my grievances at games with him, um, which to some people's amusement, but Kai Havertz, to some, he gets a free pass because of the goal against Man City. Other supporters are saying he's crap, get rid, we'd have Werner what? back, blah, blah, blah. Werner didn't oh, feature yeah. against Man United, but Sterling... Mm, like, listen, people that know me well know my views on Sterling. There's a reason why Man City got rid of him. Um, I don't think he's somebody's going to win us the title. He's not a Duff, he's not a Robin who's going to be that type of winger what do you think of their future Steve do you think there's something with them with Graham Potter can Graham potentially get the best out of them in well, I... a, a diamond shaped midfield or a 4-3-3 three, three? what do you see happening I, with those two I read an article that um, Potter had written about Sterling and he said he couldn't trust him he was on Facebook. He was on the, um, the news on Facebook. And he went through the reasons why. And I can fully understand that. Raheem Sterling is not a natural goal scorer. He will score 12 goals out of 30 chances. And everyone said he had a great Euro. I look at it and I think to myself, hold on a second. He had a great Euros. Well, He, he did quite well, but I wouldn't say a great Euro. I think he's one. Of, and people are saying, oh, he's a, he's, a, he's a certainty for the England team. To me, no. To me, no. Trust me when I say this. Pep would never let anyone that he thought could help Man City and take Man City further go. It's like Jesus. Arsenal. At the moment, Things are going well. Let's look at the end of the season. He hasn't scored every week. You know, let's have a look at it. Pep would not let him go, Raheem Sterling, if he thought he was a, dare I say, a world-class player or a very good player. Never let him go. 
and he's let him go. And we've, we, he will miss more chances than he scores during the season. Um, and he huffs and he puffs, but the end product, I'm not sure. Can I have it? Young man, lots of ability, but you know what? You've got to play him at 10. It's no good playing as a centre forward. It's no good playing as wide or midfield. Playing as a 10. That's where his strength is. And he's been a victim of being swapped and pushed and we haven't got a centre forward. He played up front. And I think, do you know what? When you play in a position where you don't want to play, your confidence goes a little bit. And I think where he's played as a nine... And yet things haven't gone that well. I think his confidence has gone a little bit. And I think we need to play him at 10. But having said that, I've always said to you, Mason Mount is a 10. He's a 10. And Mason played well on Saturday. And you've got, they're both vying for that position. But Kai Havertz has sacrificed himself to play in the positions he didn't want to play. So, as a fan, you've got to give him, give him credit for that. Give him credit that he wants to win games for Chelsea, not playing where he wants to play. He doesn't, he doesn't want to play as a nine. If Potter does decide he wants to do a diamond midfield, which I'm partly for, because I think we've got the wide players to do it, especially if James comes back, Havertz has to play as a 10. I, yeah, I, I agree. He has to. I, 100%. Play Mount a little bit deeper with Kovacic and have Jorginho or Kante or even Gallagher. Do, do you know what I do, Keith? I'll tell you what I do. I get rid of Jorginho. I play Mount there. I play what, Mount. Holded? Mount is holding? No, not holding, but centre midfield. What, oh, no, what... that's what I'm saying, yeah. Play Havertz yeah. as a 10, but... Mount. Kovacic in, in the middle of the yeah. midfield. and But what I'm saying with Mason, if you tell Mason, the moment when we're going forward, the, it breaks down, get back. That boy is so, he takes, he, you could trust him. He'd get back and he'd be brilliant centre midfield. He'd be brilliant there. Um, and I don't think, I think these days of, you know, I think England's, England's downfall has been playing two holding midfield players. I think we 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 take away from our attacking that we you know in this country we've got unbelievable attacking players. Just for once, have the bollocks and have the confidence to say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go for it. We're going to play our attacking players and we're going to go for it. We play two holding players in midfield for England, and it's cost us. It's cost us. And I think with Chelsea, I think you can have one of the two breaking forward causing problems. And I think if you had, you know, Mason Mount and, and Kante there when he's fit, I think you've got the best midfield too because, you know, Mason Mount takes the respons- responsibility the moment it breaks down to get back in his holding position. Here's one for you, Steve, and we'll probably talk about it more either during the World Cup or after the World Cup or even next summer. I'll put it to you now so as, as we've got it actually on the recording. Chelsea's new defensive midfielder or slash anchor man. N'Golo Kante leaves, a certain Declan Rice comes in. Would you be happy with that? Um, I think there's a If British... we get Champions League as well, by the way. Now, I think as a British player, um, I think in the Kante role, he's the best you can buy. The best you can buy, without any doubt whatsoever. The fact it's going to cost you £120 million. If he has a good World Cup, if West Ham do slightly well, but if we get top four, we could always chuck in a couple of players in. Yeah, I, I think, I, well, you might be able to chuck in Cristiano Ronaldo and a Birmingham. You know, they'll be 44 by then and they'll be worth a huge amount of money. But but what I'm saying is, 
that boy, if you're going to take over the world class player that our boy is, Kante, and he is one of the top players I've ever seen in that role. Yeah. He'd be the person I'd buy to go in and sit in that role without any doubt whatsoever. And he, he also offers more. He and breaks. Declan hasn't reached his prime yet either. No, I think, I think, mm. and also you can trust him. You can trust him. Here, go out and he'll give you 100%. Week in, week out. Him and Mount together. And also, yeah. A lovely, lovely you know, combination. Great mates. And it might be perfect. And I've heard from friends of mine, he doesn't want to go anywhere other than Chelsea. I've heard that too, strangely enough. Yeah. I wonder if it's the same contact. We'll see. I wonder. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've got a, couple of, got a couple of big games coming up this week. We've got Salzburg in the Champions League. And then we've got Brighton coming up on Saturday. Salzburg in the Champions League. Be an interesting game, Steve, wouldn't it? In regards to, the, in regards to whether or not we can win. If we do win that game, I think we'll probably get through to the group stage. To beat Milan twice was very huge for us in yeah. this stage of the competition. Yeah. I, no. I'm expecting a win against Salzburg, and also I'm expecting us to do quite well against Brighton. Not just because of the Graham Potter factor, but I think because I think Brighton could be one of those teams, and I think there's going to be a few of them this season, that started well, but I think are going to possibly have a bit of a, a dip in form that could cost them a little bit. You know, I think Graham Potter won about six games in about 24 games or 21 games. Mm. You know, they always start well and then they have this, 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 this lapse and they end up being very near to relegation. But at the end of the day, you know, they can be a very difficult side to beat. Well, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting what happens with against Brighton. It'll also be interesting, to be fair, what he does with team selection. Does he put his strongest side out against Salzburg? Which I probably think he would, because I, I believe if I look at the, uh, the, the Champions League table, if we win and the results go in our favour in the other game, I think we actually qualify, So, which is quite impressive considering our first two results in that group. Are you expecting that, Steve? Are you expecting him to maybe shuffle the pack and maybe play or sorry, not play, rotate the squad for Salzburg or do you think he'll go all guns blazing? You know what? Him? He's got to go all guns, all guns blazing there because... We need we to top the group, four. don't we? Hey? I'm saying we need to top the group. Yeah, I think, listen, that should be an easy decision for me. All guns blazing, Best team, get the game won, and let's leave the group. Because we've climbed back from being in a real dire state, actually, in this group. And if we can qualify as winning the group, that will be an achievement uh, you know, by itself. And listen, in past years, when have Chelsea ever feared Salzburg? Never. You know... And we've got to go out, win the game, get the game won. But then we have dropped points in the past against teams we should have beaten, like Cluj, Bordeaux, Hapoel, Nicosia. It has happened, to be fair. It has. It has. But the majority of the time, we've won our group things at a canter. Hmm. Um, and we've got to get that one for all Chelsea fans. To me, as a Chelsea fan, Champions League, is to me the ultimate. That's what it's all about to me. When I hear those fantastic words, Chelsea, champions of Europe, that means the world to me. That's to me the ultimate. Not Chelsea Premier League title winners, Champions League. And that's what I was so proud when we beat Man City in that final <coughs> to have a 
a history with that football club. It meant the world to me. I was I was almost in tears. And that's what, to me, you know, this is about. You know, we always wanted to win the FA Cup. We always wanted to, to do well in the league. But we never, in my day, and even Dave Sexton's day in the 1970s, when we had the most fantastic team, it wasn't about Europe. It was about winning the FA Cup or the or the League Cup or the now that to me is the penultimate prize in football as a European club is to win the Champions League. Well, hopefully we have a good week this week whereby we don't drop points and we actually play well. It will be good to see what happens with the team selection. But Steve, before we wrap the show up, and there's something that's come through my phone that I want to discuss with you as well and make our listeners known to it as well. But before we do that, we've got a couple of listener questions. And if you want to bring in your comments, if you want to ask us, myself or Steve, a question, find us on Facebook at the Blue Day Podcast. Contact us on Instagram or Twitter or YouTube and send in your questions or views. Doesn't matter. It can be explicit or not. Doesn't doesn't matter. We're we're quite uncensored on this show sometimes. Um, Stephen from Stoke, Steve, starts off. Would you start Brozier over yeah. Bamiang as the main striker? Yes, I would. Do you know why, Keith? I think the boy's got desire. And I think he'll make things happen. I've been very unimpressed with Aubameyang. Very unimpressed. Done I don't well against what... Milan twice. Uh, he done well against Milan twice. I just feel... See, I can't believe I'm sticking up for him now, considering I didn't want him in the first place. See, this is no, what you've got I, me I to do. Feel, I watched him play against Man United, and I just thought he was in net. He was in net. He didn't yeah. make things happen. I think Brogic, he try, whether he, he succeeds or not, he tries to make things happen. And what I'd like to do is give that boy the opportunity to prove himself and come through it the other end and be a very good number nine. And I think he's got every attribute to be that. And I've never seen him come on with 15 minutes to go, ever go in his shell. He's gone for it. And I quite like that. I quite like that. I think he's... It's one of those, isn't it? You, you, it's a very hard question, but... I like him. I think he's got a very good attitude. Next question is from Gokhan from Hamburg in Germany, Steve. So we're going European now, right? <laughs> so what we've got, this, this one's for you. Steve, what part of defending from your day is missing nowadays? I'll tell you what it is. It's from cross balls. What we did, and I, I get so frustrated um, when I watch TV and they take, they show the goals in slow motion. That what I was always taught was that you work hard to get back in a position and open your body up so you can see the ball coming across and the player attacking the ball. Then you can make a decision to jump and head the ball away. The amount of times players are square and haven't got a clue what's behind them and players come in at the far post and head goals to me and also in the box if you stretch your arm you could always touch the player you were defending against so the centre forward if I was a centre half I'd touch tight so you're an arm's length away so they were never more than an arm's length away so when the ball came in or the ball was played in, you were always there. And I think that's what so many goals, and there's lots of goals. I don't, I don't know whether the, the, the listeners have... There's lots of goals going in all over the place in the Premier League, and a lot of it is down to poor defending. And I think what's happened is defenders these days are trying to prove what good footballers they are rather than what good defenders they are. 
if you understand what I'm saying. Mm. That it's all about on the ball, passing the ball, being com- comfortable on the ball, driving the ball forward. Yeah, great. But you're there as a number five, number six, number two, number three to defend first. Fair enough. One final question, and this might sort of change your mood a little bit. This is from Meehan from New York. Oh, Keith, we're getting, we're getting a real good um, question here from all over the world here, Keith. Right. Is Mason Mount constantly playing for Chelsea because he's English? If he was American, would he get the same treatment as he is now, basically? Um, so I think I, there's somebody that's not a fan of Mason Mount. I am a big fan of Mason Mount. I, I love the boy. I think he's um, he's got a lot of ability. I think he's had a bit of a... I think... The previous management, I didn't think, got in his ear telling him what a good player he was. So I think there's a, a certain players that need an arm around them, telling them how good they are. Uh, with Mason Mount, I'd be constantly put my arm around him saying, you know what, mate, I believe in you. You are some player. Uh, and I think he's a great player. Um, if we look at Mason Mount and Pulisic, and maybe that's what he's looking at. I take Mason Mount every day of the week. Um, so I'd like to think that Chelsea Football Club is run on a on a on a, on a, a thing where players are picked, played because of their ability and what they offer to the team, rather than what national you know nationality they are. Well, I think there's there does seem to be By a little way, bit of a by the way, by the way, to the American lad, I'll tell him there's a guy at Leeds. I think he's a very, very good player, and he's American. Brendan Annis, is it? I'm trying to think of this. Anderson. He is a very good player. He done well against us as well. Very, <laughs> yeah. very good player, um, and I think and. From our American uh, our listeners, I think England's hardest game could be America mm. in the World Cup. Mm. There's lots of very good players coming through. There'll, be a, your... there'll be a few players trying to make a pro, prove a point. Yeah, I think well. that could be the hardest game. That... Well, those were the... Some of the questions, this is a bit of a taster this week. Those are some of the questions we received. If you've got views or questions you want to share on us, this is a podcast to do it because we've got no restrictions. We've got nobody telling us you can't put that on there. We'll we'll put it on the show. So put it, send us your views or questions to us. Find us on Facebook, Blue Day Podcast, Twitter at Blue Day Podcast, Instagram at Blue Day Podcast. And, yeah, by all means, share us your views and we'll hopefully do this on a more regular basis. The last thing I wanted to mention to you, Steve, and I just got this as an email from the Chelsea Supporters Trust, who are yeah. very good people. They've got Chelsea at heart. They've had uh, they've sent a, an email slash message to the Premier League. Now, I don't know whether you've noticed, Steve, but the Premier League TV schedules has come out for... Yeah. Christmas and January and the Chelsea Supporters Trust has put out a message to Richard Masters, the Premier League Chief Executive, about the state of how the Premier League is treating our, us, basically, as supporters because of kickoff times, announcements very late in the day with certain games. If you haven't noticed, uh, Steve, or if you haven't heard about it, the game against Newcastle, which I'm going to, thankfully, on the 12th of November is a half-five kickoff. The last train, I believe, leaving Newcastle back to London is 7 o'clock. Oh, my God. So, if you're going by train, hopefully you can get yourself back to London on the Saturday. Otherwise, you've got a very expensive trip uh, deal with the weekend. But the fixtures have been announced for Christmas and New Year. 
Uh, Chelsea are not playing on Boxing Day now. They're playing the day later on the 27th against Bournemouth. They're playing on New Year's Day against Nottingham Forest. And the game against Manchester City has now been moved to the 5th of January. That was announced around in the after, about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Chelsea Supporters Trust has sent this to Richard Masters, and I, and I quote, Dear Mr Masters, we are writing to you as the elected board of the Chelsea Supporters Trust. The Premier League is now 13 days late to announce the fixtures date for matches set to be played in December and January. These type of delays have such a negative impact on supporters. In 2020, you co-wrote an open letter to the government regarding the return of supporters to stadiums during the pandemic. In this letter, you said that, and I quote, the football is not the same without fans. The CST notes this claim and is concerned by the continued contempt shown by the Premier League to supporters on a weekly basis. Late announcement dates inappropriate kickoff times and bizarre stipulations imposed on supporters have led us to the conclusion that this was a baseless claim made by you when the Premier League organisation was financially at risk during the COVID-19 pandemic. We urge you to communicate better with supporters and explain why delays to announcements are faced. The silence is deafening and is insulting to us supporters. The festive period is a very busy and expensive time for all and supporters are currently unable to make plans or book annual leave with employers. Train fares continue to rise daily, and there is clearly little empathy from the football authorities being offered. During a meeting with the Football Supporters Association and Premier League Network back in 2020, you personally denied to our board members that the Premier League saw supporters as customers. We are concerned about this claim. If you would like to allay these concerns, we would welcome the opportunity to meet with you and your board to discuss the various problems faced by our members and supporters. End quote. Steve, what do you think? I totally agree with the Chelsea supporters. I totally, totally agree. This whole thing, we're going through the most incredible time of our lives in terms of trying to make ends meet. And it seems to me them they're trying to make it harder for, for fans. You know, honestly, that whole thing about the Newcastle game sums it all, all up to me in terms of, you know, there's no thought goes into anything. It's all about, you know, this is the product. Deal with it. This is how we're going to play it. There's no thought. There's no about the most important things. That, uh, as I said to you before, Keith, the most, to me, the most important people in football are the supporters, because without them, it wouldn't work. Um, well, be, be, before maybe, you be, before you touch on that, Steve, I've just got the kickoff times for them three games over Christmas, right? So Chelsea Bournemouth on the twenty seventh of December is a half five kickoff. Yeah. Nottingham Forest versus Chelsea on New Year's Day is a half four kickoff. Yeah. And Chelsea versus Man City on the fifth of January, eight o'clock kickoff. Oh my God, that's that's yeah. So Chelsea fans are going to be driving down the motorway and and getting home what one o'clock, two o'clock by the time they get away. Well, to be fair, we can't just sort of consider the Chelsea fans here. We have to consider all of them. You know, we're playing Man City. Most of their fans actually are in Manchester rather than Man United fans and even Bournemouth to an extent. But you again, you look at the train costs, they're going to go up. You look at, you know, even coach travel now. The Newcastle game that I'm going to, thankfully I got my tickets in advance, they were £54 each way. If I didn't do it advance, they would be 120 each way. Yeah. yeah. No, I, it's I, ridiculous, you know isn't I think, it? No, Crazy. I, I think, I, I, Keith. I think at this time that we're in, where every little penny helps, I think it, they're very thoughtless and they're being very, you know, God, you know, those games make them early, um, so they can get home in good time. Um, just. The, 
train fares are absolutely astronomical at the moment and they're going up every day you know every well month you know i just think they've got to think more about the fans they're the most important people they make it work and they've got to be treated with respect Hmm. definitely so hopefully the premier league probably won't sort themselves out short term but hopefully long term this will eradicate yourself because this isn't the first time this has happened in regards to late announcements to kick off time so hopefully not just the Chelsea supporters trust but all associations yeah. can get behind this and sort this out because this is again as, as you say it's ridiculous and things are going up and yeah. it for me based on what I've read there and based on the kickoff times this isn't for supporters that are going to games. These are for the supporters that are sitting on the couch with their I agree. remote. I agree. And also, Keith, you know, with all due respect, are people going to make, you know, like a guy goes to football and he's got two kids at home and he's thinking to himself, right, what I do, we have beans on toast for two days and we won't heat the house because I want to go and see Chelsea Newcastle. Yeah. You know, that's what is going to happen. Mm. And it's, it's, mm. we've got to now look at it and say, right, how can we help the supporters? How can we help the finances of the supporters? Not making it difficult for them. Mm. How can we help them? How can we make football easier for them to, if they want to go and see a football game, how do we make it less expensive? Because the clubs are making huge amounts of money anyway. You know, it's, 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 it's quite sad that we're in this situation and decisions like this are being made. Um, it is really sad. Because it's going to be, and I'm sure that a lot of Chelsea supporters will say, well, actually, my kids mean more or my wife means more and heat in the house means more. Than watching their favourite team, which is their their love of their life. Mm. You know, that so you're in between in betwixt on whatever you do, you can't win. Well, sorry to end on a bad note. However, <laughs> in in terms of the fixtures, hopefully something will change. Maybe something. Um, will, there'll be a compromise later down the line. I don't think there'll be anything short term, as we've said. But in terms of the Blue Day podcast, we are approaching the end of the year, and it's been a very busy year for for us and for the podcast itself. But we've got big plans coming for 2023, so stay tuned for that. This week as well is going to be quite busy because we've got an interview with the son of John Neal, the famous Chelsea manager from the 80s, David Neal. He's going to be on the show talking about his father and talking about the times of Chelsea in the 80s. So if you're a fan of Chelsea in the 80s, and why not? You know, Chelsea in the 80s was quite a, an interesting time. Steve Wicks can definitely vouch for that, being there in all those years ago. Be sure to listen to that one. We are going to upload that later in the week, and we've got a few more exclusive interviews, surprise interviews that I'm sure everyone who likes this show will want to listen to. Those announcements will be made in due course. But if you're a fan of the show and you haven't seen us on social media, find us on Twitter at the Blue Day Pod, Instagram at the Blue Day Podcast, Twitter.com slash the Blue Day Podcast, where you'll find all the information required. And you can find us on YouTube as well. But you can also download us wherever you find your favourite podcast. We're not that hard to find, Steve, are we? we you know, we're not hiding no. behind the couches. We're, we're quite open. You know, as, as soon as you type in Blue Day Podcast, we're the first ones there. You could hardly miss us. Subscribe to our channel. It would be greatly appreciated. Every one of our listeners is our friends as well on this show. And we will hopefully bring more content to you during the World Cup as well, where we will be talking about good old England, and we'll be talking about Chelsea players in the competition as well. Steve, anything to close the show before we wrap this up? No, I, listen, I, 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 I think that, um, you know, as a Chelsea fan, and we're all Chelsea fans, our aim should be to get out of top four 
um, to progress in, in the Champions League. And who knows? We won the Champions League when we no one gave us a chance. Let's hope we can do that again this year. That'd be fantastic. You never know. You never know what's around the corner. So, folks, we hope you enjoyed today's show. We hope you're going to listen to our future shows as well with ex-Chelsea players and ex-Chelsea personnel. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Stay safe and carefree. Go, go, go.